Okay, I'd like to bring the uh, Metro North Long Island Committee meeting for the month of October uh, to order. Uh, we have no public speakers. Uh, I need a motion to approve the minutes of September 27th. So moved. Second. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Carry. Howard? Uh, good morning, and um, thank you. First, uh, one thing I'd like. First thing I would like to do is um, to honor five Metro North employees who were involved in a uh, very important incident earlier this year, um, and it's a perfect illustration of why it's important to look out for the safety of our colleagues as well as our own every day. Robert DiStefano, an electrician who works in Harmon Shop for house maintenance, had collapsed while walking to the parking lot. One of Mr. DiStefano's co-workers, Ray Castrovinci, saw Bob collapse and immediately realized he was not breathing and had no pulse. Ray called for help and began CPR. Other Har Harmon Shop employees, who are also members of the Metro North Railroad uh, uh, Harmon Shop Fire Brigade, Pat Matwijic, Scott Cole, Joe Hyatt, and John Fisher, heard the call for help and went to aid Mr. DiStefano. Mr. Hyatt had the presence of mind to carry an automatic external defibr defibrillator with him was prepared in the event it was necessary to defibrillate Mr. DeStefano. De Thankfully, as Mr. Cole continued CPR, Mr. DeStefano, De sorry for the mispronunciation, Mr. DeStefano resumed breathing normally. The Croton EMS ambulance and medic arrived and took over. The quick actions of Bob's co-workers saved his life. They are to be commended and thanked for their selfless action and are, and are an exemplary illustration of employee safety being everyone's concern in the workplace. The happy ending, Mr. DeStefano was currently at home recovering from his ailments. So I would like to ask the five employees to please come up to receive a plaque. Mr. Hyatt, Mr. Castro Vincey, Mr. Cole, Mr. Matwijic, and Mr. Fisher. John, let me get yours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I'm sorry if I missed your name a little. Okay. Patrick's tweeting. Hey, Patrick. I think I got your name right. Yes, very good. Thank you, Joe. Joe. Thank you. Thanks. So let's get it. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Jim, you got to get in the front here a little bit, tighten up, guys. I was talking to you. That was you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. A round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Okay. Um, two other announcements I'd like to make. Uh, I'd like to let the uh, board know that we have appointed. Um, Tim McCarthy, who you're familiar with over the last week, months, has been the acting director, acting senior director of capital programs. He is now the uh, senior director of capital programs. So I want to welcome Tim, and I think everybody knows him. And then also one other point that in this month's agenda, um, we have included two more reports that we've been able to standardize between Metro North and the Long Island Railroad. That, as we mentioned, that was one of our goals. Um, so this month we have cons made a standardization of the uh, safety report and I think the capital program report. Is that the other one? We're yeah. yeah, we're getting there. Okay, so those are the two we're working towards making that happen. <clears throat> um, with that. Okay, status of operations. <clears throat> Match our notes. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Status of operation is outlined on page 13 of your agenda book. Uh, in September, we operated at 97.4 percent. This was below our goal of 97.7 percent. Although slightly below goal, both the AM and the PM peaks were uh, well above goal. The off-peak uh, ran uh, weekday ran at uh, 96.4. The key event in that, of course, was uh, in September the fire at the 138th Street Bridge, which I uh, reviewed with the. Uh, 
you last month. That resulted in 70 trains, and we only ran 89.1 percent that day. Uh, of the 30 days in September, we operated below 90 per 95 percent twice. Uh, we had 40, 447 trains operated late out of 17,422 that were scheduled. 99.5% uh, of our trips were completed, and 98.9% .9 of our trains operated with a full contest. Of uh, special note on the Harlem line, this was the fifth consecutive month where we ran at 99% uh, or better on that particular line. And on September 4th, uh, we had our seventh 100% uh, day for the year. On the west of Hudson, that is outlined on page 18 in your agenda book. The west of Hudson service operated at 96.7% in September, which is above our goal of 96.3. 54 trains operated late out of 1,623. Uh, the Port Jervis line operated at 95.1, which was uh, slightly below our goal of 95.2. The Pascag Valley operated at 97.8 in September, uh, well above goal of uh, 97. And in September, 99.6 percent of the trips uh, were completed. Uh, mean distance between failures, that's outlined on page 17 of your agenda book uh, for the month of August. MDVF was 127,910 against a goal of 115,000. And year to date, our MDBF is 144,758. Uh, that's the operating report. I have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the, the MDBF on the P32, the goal, yep. it says it's 8,500 for the Genesis locomotives? Uh, I believe that's for the BL20. Yeah, I think, but it says, yeah. yeah, I think it's just a. I think we transposed them. Oh, yeah, I think okay. that was transposed. Yeah, that, yeah. that should be for the BL20 is 8,500. Right. Okay. The, uh, the, P, uh, the 32s are, I believe, 35. Right, 000. yeah, they look into. Okay, I okay. just want to make sure yeah. that no one's changing the goal. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, financial. <coughs> okay, good morning. Financial report for August. <clears throat> Comparing actual results against the July plan begins on page 20. And I pr will provide some highlights against non reimbursable results for this report. On a broad basis, year to date August results tell a story of consistency and confirms that our cautiously optimistic revenue increase projections and, re re and expense reduction estimates included in the July plan continue to be realized. And in fact, results show indic and indicate additional ridership um, increases and lower and or timing delays in spending. For the month of August, net deficit of 51 million is favorable versus July plan by 6%. Year-to-date August net deficit of $412 million remains favorable versus July plan by 3 percent, and this is where we stood last month. On a year-to-date net cash deficit of $228 million is favorable versus the July plan by 12 percent, and this is where we stood last month as well. I want to mention today that back in March, I had briefed the committee and this was at that time the separate Metro North Committee on, the two, on two key financial management initiatives that we had put in place at the beginning of January to further reduce budget spending. The first initiative was the reduction of overtime spending, which you received a briefing of last month. The second initiative was our strategic procurement initiative to achieve reductions in inventory spending, and that was through partner reviews of business processes between the operating department and the procurement departments on materials purchasing and maintenance inventories. This initiative has achieved great results in reducing our cash disbursement on non-reimbursable inventory by six million year to date through August. So these partnered reviews has assessed inventory replenishment levels and deferred certain inventory purchases while maintaining the same level of operational service quality. On page 35, if you'd like to go to that, we have key performance indicators. All these performance indicators are positive against the July plan. Some highlights I'd like to mention is that year-to-date August fair operating ratio is 58 percent and is 1.1 favorable to the July plan. One-third is due to higher ridership and two-thirds is due to lower expenditures. Year-to-date August cost per passenger is $11.31, which is favorable to the July plan by 2 percent. Interestingly, year-to-date 
fair operating ratio has continually and gradually increased <coughs> and year-to-day cost per passenger has continually and gradually decreased each month since the spring of this year as ridership has rebounded and our cost reduction initiatives have been implemented. So these results as of year-to-date August also exceed results achieved through the end of last year. This concludes my section of the report and now Bob will cover ridership. Good morning. The monthly ridership report is in your book starting on page 36 that shows the August results. Um, on Friday, you were emailed out the preliminary uh, September numbers, which I'm just going to summarize. Uh, for Metro North, the month September, uh, again, quite positive. Uh, commutation ridership in, in September grew 2.2 percent. Non-commutation ridership grew 3.4 percent. And total ridership uh, grew 2.7 percent to just over 6.9 million. Uh, Year-to-date through September, um, total ridership is now up 1 percent compared to last year. Uh, commutation with the September results is now slightly positive, 0.0, but it's slightly higher than 09 through September. And non-com is up 2.5 percent for the year-to-date for nine months. And I'm glad to answer any questions. Any questions? Thank you. Capital, Tim. Good morning. Um, capital report begins on page 48 in your book, and I've got a couple of quick highlights for you. Uh, our second overhaul, West of Hudson Locomotive, has been shipped from the uh, overhaul facility. Um, that project is going very well. Uh, on our drainage projects, I've got two things to tell you. Uh, first one is in the in the lower Bronx, <clears throat> where we're about two thirds of the way through uh, a contract. Uh, Improving the drainage in, in the uh, between MO and Fordham, um, we have successfully hooked up two of the uh, connections to the New York City DEP, and that should really help the flooding problems that we've experienced there. And uh, secondly, uh, up in Ossining for Sing Sing Creek, where the award package for the design of the flood mitigation is circulating right now, so we should get going on that pretty quickly. Um, Finally, uh, we have awarded the Croton Harmon Peekskill station, uh, not station, but platform and canopies and stairs work, and that should be starting shortly. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Okay. Safety. Good morning. I'll be summarizing the safety statistics through August, uh, beginning on page 53 in your books. The total employee injuries in 2010 through August are at 120 injuries as compared to 156 in 2009. This represents a 23.1 percent reduction of total injuries. Our FRA reportable injuries in 2010, we have a 2.45 frequency index as compared to 2009, a 2.82 frequency index representing a 13.2 percent reduction. And the combined lost time and restricted duty Injury indexes are 1.94 for 2010 as compared to 2.26 in 2009, representing a 14 percent reduction. Our customer injuries, total customer injuries per million rides, um, 2010 we have a frequency index of 2.78 as compared to 2.83 in 2009, representing a 1.6 percent reduction. And I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Any questions? Okay, we have a late arriving speaker who would like to say a few words, Warren Getz. Uh, thank you very much. It, unfortunately, it takes time to get through the security here, and it, it makes it hard to sometimes get here, especially when this public portion starts exactly at 8.30, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm speaking on, on two behalves. One, as uh, I'm a commuter west of Hudson, as a lot of people probably know, and I regularly ride the Pascack Valley line. And uh, on June 20th, there was some changes to the schedule, which took out the first train, 1600, and took out train 1639. And both of these have had a profound effect on uh, the availability of commuters. The first thing is, is when train 1600 was removed, they moved up train 1602. 
but didn't move it up enough so that passengers who are trying to get to Lower Manhattan by 7 o'clock can. The train arrives 1602, too late into Hoboken to make the path connection. And that should have been correct on the upcoming schedule changes, but unfortunately it didn't. The second one was train 1639 was a wonderful opportunity for Metro North to add a badly needed second express train on the Pascack Valley line. Rockland County contributes a lot more to the MTA than it gets back. This was a wonderful opportunity, even though the MTA had financial difficulties, to correct a, an outstanding problem with the MTA. And it should have been done, and it still can be done, and Metro North should conduct its uh, negotiations with New Jersey Transit. Also, these uh, current schedule changes look like there's some concessions being made by New Jersey Transit to some of the communities that opposed the sidings on the Pascack Valley Line. I hope that Metro North has alerted New Jersey Transit that by making some of these changes that they're going to get some concessions from these communities and allow them to build the uh, golf siding in Oradell, which is critically needed to improve service. Also, I'm concerned is, is some of the connections that succumbs with this new schedule. In certain times of day, there's gaps in, in the service to Penn Station, and we've got to ensure that there's not a long wait at Secaucus to make the transfer into Penn Station. The final item is, is I am the communications director over at the Empire State Development Corporation. And we did run into some difficulty because we were not informed that Metro North was going to move its customer service uh, center to uh, the main floor of the uh, Grand Central Terminal, which I think is a fantastic idea. But the I Love New York booth was relocated to another lo location. And we had a telephone line in our uh, I Love New York booth. And we've had exceeding difficulty getting through to the people at Metro North to work with us on this project. Verizon has moved the line over to the new terminal, but we have, have yet to get a response from Metro North on getting the assistance of getting that line connected into its new location so that we can use it, and we need it for uh, our Internet access for the I Love New York t uh, tourist information. And I really would appreciate some, some cooperation, some contact on this. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Our yeah. information. Yeah. One minute. Let me just say, Oren, we'll look into that. Um, the issue about the phone line, uh, see what we can do. Um, yeah, we have two information items um, on scheduling. Bob, do you want to handle both of them, please? <clears throat> sure. Uh, there are two memos in your package. Uh, there are some mo very minor west of Hudson schedule changes taking effect on November 7th. Um, on the Pascack Valley, we've worked with New Jersey Transit. Um, there's a, a couple stopping changes being made, and we, we are repositioning a couple uh, morning inbound and other off-peak trains to provide what we feel are better intervals, um, early arrival off-peak into New York, and better intervals uh, between outbound off-peak trains during the midday. Um, on the Port Jervis line, very minor changes. Only The changes are only on the uh, northeast corridor, so they affect a couple of um, trains' arrival times in Penn Station. Nothing's actually happening to the Port Jervis Line trains themselves if you're going to Hoboken. The second memo is, a, is a, our annual look ahead at what we're doing with regard to special services towards the end of the year. Um, this year, in addition to our normal uh, panoply of, of schedule changes for the holidays from Thanksgiving weekend, or actually the weekend before Thanksgiving, through the end of the year, through uh, Christmas, New Year's, um, we also have two additional sporting events happening at uh, Yankee Stadium, even though baseball's over, sports are not over. We have two football games. We have uh, Army Notre Dame on November 20th, which we think is going to be big for us. And also there's a new Big East Bowl game on December 30th. So we're going to be running um, service comparable to what we would run for a, uh, for a baseball game uh, for both of those, and we expect to get several thousand people on the trains. Um, back to the holidays, as, as, our, as our usual uh, way of doing business, we'll be issuing a four-day special schedule for Thanksgiving weekend. It's a very unique travel weekend for us. Uh, the day before Thanksgiving is the biggest day of the year. Uh, Thanksgiving itself is the, is the heaviestly traveled uh, major holiday of the year. And then you have the shopping on Black Friday, a lot of shopping on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, Chris, uh, the weekends between Thanksgiving and New Year's, we'll be running our usual program of shopper specials, uh, bringing extra people into the city. And then on Christmas, New Year's, we'll have special schedules on the eves, which are this year Fridays. And uh, in particular, on late night on New Year's Eve, we'll run our usual uh, complement of extra service overnight to carry the 
revelers uh, home through through the night any questions questions Howard? Okay, then we have um, a license agreement, which I think was passed out, and this is simply something, uh, an effort on behalf of Dutchess County to help the county as they develop the rail trail, uh, part of which is on the right-of-way of the Beacon Line, which we own. Um, so this is going to be going through finance and real estate, uh, but we wanted to put it on for information for this committee as well. Okay. And then we have one action item, um, which is a joint action by Metro North and Long Island to increase commissary prices effective January 1st. Um, as you may recall, the board passed a policy in the last year or so, <coughs> excuse me, two years ago, that uh, we could increase prices with uh, in range of CPI. Uh, what has happened subsequent to then is that the cost of both the labor costs um, and the cost of material have increased much more than CPI. Um, so we are coming back to the board to ask for approval for an increase of, for the two railroads. Um, and they are approximately about 4% for each of us, a little slightly different in each case. Um, and they have been priced different pieces Different of the products are priced based on the competitive business nature at Penn Station and Grand Central. They're not the same. So each of us are doing slightly different increases in pricing to match what happens at each of the two stations. And this is something for committee approval. First of all, any questions? Jim. Um, Howard, does the, uh, in, in retrospect, <clears throat> does the CPI um, gauge uh, uh, it still makes sense, or should we adjust the formula? Um, well, that's a good question, Jim. It, it clearly, in this case, does not reflect uh, what, what is happening in this sub-market. Um, I, th I think that's something worth um, uh, thinking about, and then let's, we'll get back to it. We'll talk with Helena about that, and we'll get back to you. Okay. Okay, I need a motion. Second? All in favor? Any opposed? Carry. Okay, Elena. Okay, good morning. Um, just in case um, someone did not hear, uh, the Long Island Railroad did have extremely limited uh, train service over the weekend. Um, on uh, the past weekend, we were able to accomplish a very important modernization project with regard to uh, half of Jamaica. Um, we cut over into our new uh, Jamaica Central Control uh, the operation of the J Tower. So J Tower will no longer be operational starting, you know, 12.01 uh, last uh, this morning. Uh, we began operating out of the new control center. Um, over the weekend, we were able to use the uh, track outage to accomplish uh, a very important um, right of way cleanup effort that we were undertaking as well. So while they were doing testing in the um, J Tower area, we were able to do a substantial cleanup in the Hall Tower area. Uh, we also were able to accomplish a very important um, switch replacement in the area of Hicksville. Uh, so we were using the track outage um, for uh, quite a bit of activity on the railroad while we did the um, required testing for the cutover. Uh, as many of you have heard, we of course have to do now the second half of Jamaica on the weekend of November 6th and 7th. Uh, we will now you know, proceed toward the hall uh, cutover and we will then do a J Tower area row cleanup, right of way cleanup. Uh, we'll use the same transportation plan uh, that we used over this weekend. We will ask customers to access the railroad for uh, business purposes. We ask them to know before they go. We will continue to operate um, on that weekend trains on the uh, Babylon branch and the Long Beach branch, and we will have extra service on the Port Washington branch with um, uh, busing at Mineola um, to Jamaica and the E-Train um, service into Penn. So with that, I, I do want to compliment the um, Long Island Railroad workforce. 
uh, and our customers. Um, both groups did exactly what we needed them to do in really an outstanding way over the weekend. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn to Ray. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The, the operating report starts on page number 68 of our committee book. The Long Island Railroad's on-time performance goal is 95.1 percent. Our overall on-time performance for September was 92.4. The uh, OTP, OTP for the peak was 91 percent, with the AM peak finishing at 92.9 percent and the PM peak at 88.9 percent. Our off-peak was 92.9 percent, with weekday off-peak finishing at 92 percent and weekend off-peak finishing at 94.9 percent. And during September, 99.1% of the peak trains met the seating, <coughs> sorry, seating standard, and 98.5% of scheduled trips were completed. 270 trains operated more than 15 minutes late. Uh, during the month of September, we had one 100% rush hour that occurred in the morning. To date, we have had 36. <coughs> in terms of equipment, the car availability for AM peak was met each day in September. And the total uh, fleet MBDF goal of 110,000 was exceeded in August. And I note here there's a one-month lag in reporting. The most significant event during the month of September uh, that affected our performance was the uh, tornado that touched down on, on Thursday, September 16th, right during the middle of the uh, p.m. rush hour. Uh, we had eight trees completely down between Harold and Jamaica, and they damaged five uh, high-tension poles, 10 uh, cross arms, and we wound up with four spans of wire on the ground. On the Port Washington branch, 14 trees toppled, plus the major portions of another 15 trees fouling our tracks, and that caused two broken communications poles and one broken high tension cross arm. And in addition, uh, City Field Station sustained damage to portions of the platform roof. This incident resulted in 215 late and canceled trains on the 16th and an additional 147 residual delays on the 17th um, as we tried to clear the uh, trees and uh, deal with the utility outages that resulted. Uh, we were greatly assisted, especially in the uh, first hours of the, or first minutes of the storm by the MTA Police uh, Emergency Services, as Helena had pointed out last, uh, at the last meeting. Uh, moving on to safety. Reportable employee accidents are up 4%. Customer accidents are down 10%. To total number of rail accidents are down 53%. And overall fire incidents are up 12%. And that concludes the operating report, and I'm ready for any questions you may have. Any questions? Yes, in the, in the um, chart about delays and num what the causes of delays, is that, that miscellaneous other category, which seems to be a large number. Yes, that would reflect the storm. Oh, okay. I mean, just, it, but it seems mo month after month that's a larger. Yeah, it's, it's a large. It's a. I mean, it's you know, it's for September it was five hundred and three. For year to date, it's three thousand nine eighty four. And I'm just wondering what the usual breakdown of that is. Usually, it would be for a major thing such as a snowstorm. There could also be a um, you know the the thing with the tornado, or there may be a. Um, incident that has yet to be classified, and once it's classified, it'll be moved out of that area. Oh, okay. I mean, it just, just f when you see other, you sh should usually, I would think, would usually be less than most of the other categories. Here, it's greater I think because than of all the, the categories. I think because of the nature of the incident. Like, for example, a snowstorm would be a thousand, probably a thousand dollars. So, I mean, no, but Ray, it seems that we've had then, I mean, this is true in 2010. I mean, 2009. This is the highest... If I'm reading this right, it's the highest category that causes delays. It it is not really a miscellaneous. It's it's for things uh, like weather, you know, that are not related to any railroad departments. And 2009 is high also because of snowstorms. I can get you you know a further breakdown, but that, that, it's, it's, that, it'd be good if you get yeah because it's not really miscellaneous. Go will you know like for example if we have a miscellaneous equipment problem that won't become an O that will become a, a mechanical delay. And the same right. is true in the other in the other areas. Okay, but it'd be, it'd be good to see a breakdown. It just seems to be a, a, a great amount. But also, another um, thing I noticed the the M7 the goal for Long Island Railroad is three hundred thousand, whereas the goal for Metro North is three fifty thousand. The MDBF, 
And it'd just be, it'd be good to see an explanation now, but I, I, could, I could come up with one myself, an explanation of why RM, in Long Island Railroad's M7 goal is lower than Metro North's M7 goal. Uh, Helena, first, I want to congratulate you and thank you for the uh, overwhelming and comprehensive communication of the extremely limited service. Uh, I, no, I, I thought it was... I thought it was overwhelming, as it, as it should have been. The, I mentioned in the email yesterday, I rode the Port Washington line into and from the city, and I just wanted you to talk about the impact of uh, Long Island bus service on Saturday and Sunday and what the railroad would do were there no Long Island bus. You know, we um, uh, really uh, have to compliment um, Joe Smith's operation. Uh, Long Island bus did an outstanding job. Um, not only Long Island bus, but MTA bus. Uh, we, it was such a large event for us um, that we pulled buses from both of his operations. Um, you know, Long Island bus, and I've made this comment before, is an extremely important component of providing substitute service for uh, Long Island Railroad. And it can happen in any number of events. You know, of course, scheduled ones are the easiest. <coughs> Unscheduled um, can be the most difficult to find uh, substitute bus service. And because Long Island bus, you know, is um, centrally located, the drivers know our geography, uh, they are a very important component of that substitute service. You know, you um, had sent me an email yesterday you know, with a very good question. What would we do if, if Long Island bus weren't available? Um, we would have to uh, put in place a substantial number of additional contracts with private operators. You know, I understand that the county executive may be pursuing privatization uh, for Long Island bus. We would really have to move quickly to put in a contract uh, with the private operator um, to ensure that they would be available. We do have contract rights that we use with um, MTA bus uh, and other private contractors in Suffolk County. Uh, but there's no question, they are, um, you know, a, uh, a tremendous uh, adjunct to our substitute service plan that we need to have in place. And I assume, Helena, just to follow up on that briefly, that if Long Island bus didn't exist, there'd be additional costs incurred in terms of having this standby service, whether for a scheduled event or something, an act of God or other unscheduled event. You know, we pay a um, contract rate to Long Island bus. Uh, we pay that to MTA bus because, you know, there's no free lunch even within the family. Um, so we, we certainly have negotiated over time um, on those rates. Um, we, we try for the family discount. We don't always get it. Um, but uh, I would say that, you know, you're going to get into a much more competitive situation when you're dealing with a private operator. Now, being that the fleet would still be owned by Nassau County, we would, you know, look for government to support the effort because it's still the same ridership base. And they're residents of Nassau County, residents of Suffolk County, and Queens. Um, but... There's no question it changes the mix when you have a private operator. Thank you, Phil. The last thing I want to say is I, I want to make sure that we're not operating on a false premise that there are only two choices. One is Long Island buses that exist now or privatization. There's a third horrible option, which is no Long Island bus service as of January 1st or some point in 2011. And, and I think we all shouldn't lose sight of that. But I, I thank you for that. Okay, more questions? Okay, finance and ridership. Good morning. Financial report for Long Island Railroad begins on page 82. I guess if there's one takeaway I'd like you to have for today's financial report, it's that um, despite ridership still being down compared to 2009, the financial performance versus budget of railroad is better, uh, better than the budget, actually favorable, which is due to two things. One is we had projected and assumed that there would be ridership loss and built that into the budget. And secondly, expenses are down versus budget. So I think that's really the primary takeaway from the financial report. Um, I usually start with ridership, and um, I know you've received the joint memo. Long Island Railroad, uh, during the month of September, experienced a drop of 1.4% in ridership compared to 2009. Uh, you know, frankly, that was a little disappointing because the two months of July and August were strong, so uh, we were hoping for better than that. Uh, commutation was down 0.7 percent. There were 807 less monthly tickets that were sold during the month versus the prior year. 
Um, again, it's primarily economics uh, driven uh, with the uh, workforce levels in the city. I will say that we noticed that uh, financial sector and public uh, and professional sector employment rates improved in August, so we're hoping that may help us uh, as we go forward on commutation. Non-commutation was down 2.3% in September. Um, peak one-way ticket sales dropped 2%. Off, off peak one-way ticket sales dropped 2.4%. Um, we, we believe, uh, and, it, and it, we, we looked at this in a little bit more detail, that uh, two events that happened during the month uh, impacted, uh, impacted non-commutation. One is the uh, tornado uh, that Ray Kenny mentioned previously, which uh, likely had an impact on some off-peak ridership during that event. Uh, but also uh, at the uh, Labor Day weekend when there was uh, the Hurricane Earl uh, we, uh, threat, uh, we project we lost uh, approximately 30,000 rides uh, over that period of time uh, due to various service reductions. The, uh, on year-to-date, uh, through September, we've carried 61.2 million riders. That's 1.7 percent less than 2009. Um, uh, again, we, we, when we saw these figures, we, we went back to assess what some of the factors might be over the whole year. Uh, there are three unique events to 2010 that have uh, cost about 0.5% ridership loss. Those are the Hall uh, Tower fire that we discussed uh, the, the prior uh, meeting, the Hurricane Earl, and also the fact that there was no uh, U.S. Golf Open this year on Long Island. Uh, we also did look at the impacts of the May and September service reductions on ridership, um, and as of now, early, early results seem to show that that's had a very minimal impact on, um, on ridership loss. Computation ridership year-to-date is down 2.6 percent. Uh, through September, non-com was down 0.5 percent. That summarizes ridership. Moving on to the budget. Through July, our total revenues are $487 million, which is 3.6% unfavorable. However, most of that, virtually all of it, is due to uh, timing of the uh, uh, capital project reimbursements. On expenses through, uh, through the end of the month, uh, we are $31 million favorable, uh, favorable meaning underspending versus budget. Uh, labor, labor expenses net are right on. Uh, straight time is right on budget. Uh, I usually do uh, spend a, a few extra seconds on overtime. Overtime is 1.6 million favorable uh, versus uh, versus the budget. Uh, we've spent nine million dollars less on overtime this year than we had through this point in 2009, and overtime hours worked are down 229,000 hours compared to this point last year. Non-labor expenses are favorable by 25 million dollars. That's primarily in the areas of materials, supplies, and contracts. Um, uh, Kim had noted the key performance indicators. Uh, in the effort to uh, make our two reports consistent, we are now also including that, that page for the Long Island Railroad. That's on page 99. And really what it shows is it some shows in, in analytics what I've just described. If you look at the year to date, uh, you'll see that's the bottom half you'll see that the fare box operating ratio is uh, now 45.8%. Uh, that's better than it had been uh, through the prior month. Um, and that reflects the uh, reduced expenses uh, uh, primarily. And the, uh, you can see uh, cost per passenger has also gone down for the same reason. Um, if not for the unfunded pension liability, our fare box operating ratio would be 50%. And that concludes the financial report. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, I, I just, and I don't mean to raise it, but I just noticed it in the context of seeing page 99 and now being able to compare one railroad to another railroad on page nine, based upon the, the same page. <coughs> Could we get, and I don't, not necessarily today, but at some point, some analysis as to the cost per passenger and why and how that is computed from both railroads because obviously there is a significant oh, I strike that there is a there is a difference between the cost per passenger on Metro North than there is on Long Island 
and I'd like to try to get some idea as to why that is. I, I know we have some, uh, we've already looked at that issue, but I think Kim, you'll be, we'll, Kim and I will work together That'd on that, great. maybe for the next report. Yeah, we'll have something be Because, because uh, it, it yeah. does, the great thing about page 99 and the page that has been there for Metro North, it allows you to compare, mm -hmm. and there are differences, and I'd like to just right. try the to figure out why there are differences. Right, differences in the operation, et cetera, right. yeah. Yeah, you can be assured that the calculations are done consistently, and then right. next month we will show you the key components that make up the calculation. That, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Capital. Okay, um, and the uh, capital program report is on page 109 of the book, uh, and I am pleased to note um, three uh, milestones uh, that enhance the efficiency and reliability of our train system. Three substation buildings and their associated equipment were replaced with new modular buildings in the Inwood, Hempstead, and Floral Park. Uh, and that was a uh, um, estimated at time of completion $37 million project. The Long Island Railroad's second milestone is the award of a design contract for a new ADA compliant elevator at Atlantic Terminal space. Um, and this space was previously occupied by the temporary ticket office. So while we were doing the terminal renovations, we couldn't put this additional elevator in. Now that the terminal is open and we're in our correct ticket office space, we're going to go back to that other space. We've worked out an agreement with Forest City Ratner where we will now put in an additional elevator. That was the one design element of the original terminal that was, um, you know, a little bit small for what the, you know, clientele needs in terms of up and down between floors with not only ADA but um, older uh, customers and, you know, strollers. Uh, so we'll go back in and we'll do that. Um, we also have um, completed a painting package of seven bridges in Freeport, in Freeport um, as part of our effort to prolong the useful life of bridges. Um, in September, the MTA police will begin, um, well, actually, they've already begun and they'll complete it at the end of October, uh, beginning of November, a transition into their new uh, facility in Central Islip. Uh, just west of the Long Island Railroad Central Islip Station. Uh, and if you have any questions on our um, capital program, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions? Thank you. MTA, please. Good morning. Uh, for, for September, we were down one crime, 27 verse 28. Um, continuing to have a pretty good year, 229 crimes versus uh, 222. Last year we're up up seven, um, but but overall we're still averaging less than one crime a day. I just want to thank uh, the board and uh, Long Island Railroad, particularly Mitch Paley and Helena Williams, for the help with the construction of uh, District One out in Central Islip. We have began moving in, and we're out of the trailers and into a new home, and the officers appreciate it. I just want, want to thank you. Good. Any questions? Any questions? <clears throat> Michael. Yeah. Uh, good morning. The uh, report on the uh, east side access actually um, is rather short. Uh, we are now committed 57% uh, of our overall budget. Uh, and the work is proceeding both in the Queens area and the Harold um, uh, interlocking area as well as uh, uh, in Manhattan, the uh, uh, caverns and the tunnels. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of the work, uh, uh, with the tunnels, the, uh, um, in effect, in, in Manhattan, uh, the last uh, TBM drive will commence in December, and um, with that, we'll be finished with the TBM uh, in Manhattan. And at this point, we have installed uh, <coughs> larger mucking equipment, that is, the equipment that removed the muck from the cavern and the tunnels into um, uh, 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 Queens, and that uh, is actually giving us now the ability to clean up the tunnels so we can move ahead with our work. Um, the interesting uh, part of the work, although it is uh, from a uh, uh, <clears throat> just uh, the eye and engineering seem to be Manhattan, the most uh, uh, complex one is in Queens where we are working <clears throat> intensively on the uh, 
uh, moving around the various lines, and we will be starting soon um, the uh, the boring of four tunnels under the uh, uh, Sunnyside Yards. Uh, this will be uh, a very uh, technically challenging uh, task uh, since uh, uh, this is uh, soft ground. This is one of the uh, – uh, we have not done a work, a, a type of this work in New York for a long time, or if ever, in this, in this manner. Uh, the TBM machines have been um, delivered. They are in Queens. Uh, we are uh, not assembling in yet, but the, uh, we started the assemblage, and we expect to start uh, sometime in January. The, uh, the, the temporary substation required to power the TBM uh, has been powered up by Con Ed. So we are on our way. Uh, what we expect to present next time around when we come to this uh, board in November is a series of, um, uh, let's call it, um, uh, completion uh, that will allow Long Island Railroad to operate better in Metro North. Uh, and we will come in with the various projects that uh, we are accomplishing to, to, uh, to achieve this goal and will give you both uh, uh, completion dates as well as where the status of each and every one of these projects. Um, that's about it. Any questions? Okay. Uh, we have uh, 12 procurements for $26.877 million. I can get a motion in a second, and then we'll discuss. So moved. Second? Discussion. Okay, I think Long Island, you're first. Oh, I'm <laughs> Okay. Uh, there are seven procurements in this month's package, uh, totaling $24 million. There are six items in the, oh. sorry, competitive section uh, in the amount of $23.9 million, uh, and there is one item in the non-competitive section in the amount of 50000 Let me do the non-competitive first. Um, we are uh, um, asking for approval of a uh, contract with NORTAC, Track North America, in the amount of 50000 uh, for knuckle rail assemblies. We have two spares. We're about to use those. They are essential rail equipment. Uh, we don't want to use the spares until we have two more, just in case there were any emergency requirements for them. Um, so we ask for your approval uh, of that procurement. Are you taking any questions? Yeah, yeah, I think, I don't know. That's what we Second. still do, yes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Okay. Carried. Good. Thank you. In the competitive section, um, I would like to bring your attention to a, um, a, a contract, a proposed contract with Booz Allen Hamilton, um, which is in the amount of $1.4 million, uh, and it is for services associated with the analysis of the existing MTA Police Department radio system. Long Island Railroad took the lead in um, analyzing radio requirements uh, we've had team members from Metro North, Long Island Railroad, and we worked in collaboration with New York City uh, PD as well. Um, in fact, there's a number of, you know, participants in terms of evaluating radio requirements. Um, as many of you are aware, there's been a longstanding um, complaint filed with the uh, Department of Labor in 2001. Uh, and it had to do with, you know, the fact that there are dead spots in the radio system. Uh, in uh, 2008, um, Department of Labor um, asked MTA and PD to move forward on a plan, um, you know, to uh, develop a better radio system. The plan had been to participate in New York State's um, nice wind system. Uh, which was a statewide wireless radio system that could have covered our public safety elements. Unfortunately, the state um, abandoned that concept, uh, and they are not moving forward in the New York State Office of Technology with the plan. I believe the contract had been awarded to MACOM. They were not having success with it, and they pulled the plug on it. That left really our project team with the requirement of looking for alternatives. Uh, and I think the team's done an outstanding job of trying to assess the best way to go forward. Um, and I'm going to ask Mike Cohen to jump in and, and talk about the police requirement. You know, as, as mentioned, uh, there are dead spots in the radios, and uh, we, we we kind of banked on the Schwinn project with the state, you know, to carry us forward. And when that, when that was knocked in 2008, we had to develop our own project. Um, that 
coupled with uh, in 2013 is a narrow banding requirement by the federal government. Uh, we, we, we need to be in compliance with that. So we've moved this project forward. We have money in our long-term capital program, which was set aside for uh, the Schwinn project to go forward um, to get the assessment and then to start um, you know, an initial construction on, on the project. Um, we are under uh, a, this, the, the Department of State, uh, this, the Labor Department um, has cited us um, because of the radio project. We have taken remedial steps to address that, and, and um, they, they've accepted that, and we've been able to move forward, but we, we still need to build a radio long term. Um, this, this assessment um, will allow us to decide which is the best path forward. Uh, it's, 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 an, it's important for the, uh, the department. Uh -huh. um, so, in addition, I'm sorry. No. <clears throat> question. Um, why is uh, what's the expertise of Booz Hamilton in communications as opposed to companies in that field by themselves? This this was this was set out to um, th this was a competitive bid uh, through bid, bid, uh, Booz Allen. Uh, I'm not. Familiar with I'm, their I'm background. going to jump in. You know, yeah. Booz Allen does have a, a tremendous expertise in um, uh, radio infrastructure and radio requirements. One of the things we need to proceed now to a, um, uh, you know, the next level of design is to do what's known as an interference study. They do a, a map of the propagation of all the wave, you know, the radio waves, and they look for where other radio systems may be interfering and how they can address those interference issues, especially as you go down to another band, which is the big issue here. Um, so they will do some of this mapping, and they've identified the sites that need to be looked at in both Metro North and um, Long Island Territory. Uh, so, uh, you know, they will help us progress, um, you know, the uh, design forward for what, you know, the radio backbone should look like um, to cover these dead spots. How much money is set aside in the budget to actually proceed once you spend $1.4 million on the assessment? I believe it's close to $30 million, Mike. Yeah, uh, initially it was uh, $40, $41 million. There has been some spend down. There's and this, excess to $30 and, million. And, and the dead spots is required by the Department of Labor? No, no, well, the Department of Labor cited us for having an insufficient radio for the police officers. Um, so we came to an agreement and we went to a two-person patrol from a single-person patrol in order to... To, to mediate that dispute, because what happens out in the field is they can get one-way communication. Uh, other officers in the field, if somebody's calling for assistance, cannot hear them. With all due respect, I mean, we've been dealing with the New York City Transit for many, many years and spends hundreds of millions of dollars and are still not worked out with dead zones underneath the subways. Um, this is a really, you start going down this path, it is extremely expensive um, for something that I really hope that we think long and hard about whether we need or not. Um, Literally for over 10 years, they've been trying to connect the dead zones between NYPD above and below ground at the, in the subway system. Um, I'm not, you know, we should move that forward and make sure that we stop spending hundreds of millions of dollars in that area. <laughs> it's something that they've made do. I wouldn't want to be going forward and doing this just because the Department of Labor, Labor cited us. Um, I know even in the, the, the transit system, you know, that's Homeland Security, um, and we're still plotting away. I, I, I agree, and, and the issue was that not only the um, the, old, the, the system is old. It's not, we're not working on a public safety system at this time. We're working on the system that the railroad uses, and we're, we're mandated to have, for interoperability purposes, not only the narrow banding, but to have our own public safety you know, radio. And the state's not looking to resurrect any sort of wind system. I know the city right. has a nice wind system that they've got up and running, and they're looking for people to come on board. Right. No, we're, we're in discussions with the state, but at this point, they, they did shelve the SWIN system. So we, 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 we were on board with that. Uh, when they shelved it, we, d we decided we need to move forward. But uh, they, do, they are also on the same mandates, and we are talking to the state. And where, where, where we see um, <coughs> duplication, we, we absolutely want to work with them. I'm a bit reluctant to spend 1.4 million now with Booz Hamilton. So I, I, I get, I understand we need, you want to move forward, and there's opportunities there. We've waited a long time. You know, maybe there's a with the new administration coming in in January an opportunity to resurrect what everyone knows is a very good and potential system to get up and running. Um, I wouldn't want to move 
you know, with three months before finding out what possibly is in store on the statewide level of resurrecting the statewide plan? Um, I, I actually, we had pursued that very issue, you know, what might, you know, um, happen with regard to another administration and, you know, the notion that they might um, come back around to some form of statewide system. The work that Booz Allen would do, we think, will um, still be integral to whatever radio system becomes the right answer. Uh, and again, this is an approval to, you know, progress what we would need for any design. We will come back to this committee before um, any full contract, um, you know, or bidding process with regard to acquisition of the radio system itself. But the contract says that it also includes separate options for design and construction phase. We, w we will come back and, um, you know, talk with you again as a committee before we get to, you know, a... Um, a point at which we've committed to a new system because uh, that has been one of our you know concerns as well what else is out there as an option you know, regardless of what system we go with we need to get a definitive baseline on where our yeah. systems at what what's the what's the time period on the first portion of the study um, well, the review, you know, I'd have for to lack get of a better back term. to you it's a nine I, it's only I believe a nine, it's nine month study right you know, it's it's but, if any, but I would assume the nine-month included the design and the construction phase. So the question is, what's the, stu what's the time period of the initial analysis to see how that would fit in with whatever additional state review might happen based, you know, uh, in that regard? And I understand why we need it, and I support it. It's just a question of once we get to the first phase and get done, can we then see what the state may or may not want to do at that point? I, I mean, I, I can't speak further. on the state's time, you know, the time yeah. frame. Uh, I, I know that, uh, you know, up to now, uh, going in with them, it's, it's held us up for a number of years. Yeah, which, is, which we don't want to have happen any right. further, that's for sure. If I'm reading this correctly, the first phase is something less than 400000 Yes. And I think we have your agreement that before you proceed to the We're second done. phase, because the first phase is the analytic phase that's needed regardless of which system is used, we have your agreement that you would bring it back to us and give us a report on why we're moving with a certain system? That's correct. We can give you an update to make sure that we are progressing, you know, in a, in a manner that's consistent what, what may come out of the state operation as well. Um, so we'll come back. We'll I think do it the has first to phase move ahead. And we'll hold on the second phase until we come back and give you that update. Fine. Yeah, I just, I, I just noted that in the, um, the capital construction, there's a, a modification for the integrated electronic security system. And I'm just wondering if this, this contract for the, for the radios it involves some kind of integration with that, or um, if it should. No, no. This no? is the, so what you see there is just uh, uh, the completion of the ISS. And we yeah, but it should, should the radio system work with the with this in some way? In other words, if, if you have a radio the, system, we're talking to the police. Well, should the police? Th this is something that this is technical support. The the Intergraph. There is a software that resides on our computers in order for for one to be able to see the various uh, 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 screens and 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 uh, so it's a kind of a different thing. Yeah, it, it's a different thing, but I mean, it, it, when you have a radio system, can you can you identify where the police are using their radios, and would that come up? Would that be integrated into this system, or that's not something we're looking for? Well, I, I mean, it's not specifically integ uh, integrated with that system, but it is, it's very, very much related because because once the syst both systems are on board, right, um, the the communications and the ISS uh, will be working hand in hand with the cameras and the dispatch in, in within the same. Uh, facility out in Long Island City. So, but, but right. as, far, as far as the two systems talking to each other, no. No, no and, and you feel confident that, I, I mean, will this system, with all these radios, and this is to address dead spots, I understand that. But dead spots, narrow banding, and, and public safety compliance. Right. So it's multiple issues. Okay, well, we could, there's, there's some other questions I have, but we could talk. Okay, any other questions? Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? One opposition. One opposed. Okay. Is 
that the end of Low Island? Um, well, was that vote on the entire package? Yes. So then we're yeah. done. Okay. okay. Then, I'll, then let me just ask the question right. on the on the. And, on the Atlantic Viaduct package, the Keywood con contractors, yes. that will complete the Atlantic Viaduct rehabilitation program? I, it will complete all but a very small section adjacent to a station where we're still working on a station uh, design. So the, so the last the, piece will be part of the station work itself? This we're not going to, I mean, the, the, the piece that's left, right. the small piece, will be done as part of the station work. That's exactly And right. that will complete yes. the entire that viaduct. That will complete the entire viaduct. Okay. And I do want to note that um, okay. our $76 million in stimulus funds um, that completed the major section were just, you know, completed. Right. We ranked um, 27th out of 100, the top 100 um, era projects. We were 27th. Okay. Good. Thank you. Howard. Okay, thank you. Um, we have, Metro North does not have any joint procurements this month. We are participating in two of them. One you just approved, the Long Island Railroad multi-agency procurement uh, for occupational health services. The other, New York City Transit, will be seeking approval uh, to extend the terms to Hewlett Packard um, for support to different computer uh, systems. We have three procurements this month. There's one non-competitive for not to exceed $120,000. That's with the firm Nathan Airchime to lease two uh, air horn testing chambers to test and certify existing Metro North rail cars. Uh, it's an 18-month contract, not to exceed $120,000. We'd have an option for another six months. This is a requirement by the FRA in terms of testing the horns on our cars. Uh, so this is a one-time cost, and once this is done, uh, we won't need the chambers anymore. It's basically qualifying our fleet. We also have two competitive procurements, um, to, not to exceed one point, about $1.9 million. One is a negotiated uh, procurement with the firm Smart Software to furnish, install, implement, train, and support Metro North staff with a material forecasting system to for, basically to forecast our operating material needs and optimize ma material inventory reorder points to support the operation. The total value of this is not to exceed 407,000, and the other is the request approval for three change orders with Bombardier for the procurement of, um, well, for part of the overhaul of our uh, our 104 cars that they they have completed, and there's the, these particular change orders are for the procurement of equalizer beams, pair of truck and bolster assemblies, and modifications to the cab signal system. These were all work efforts that we could not estimate until the cars were actually taken apart and worked on when they were when they did the work up in uh, upstate New York. And the value of these is about one point five million dollars. Okay, any questions? On the uh, horn testing, what how does the railroad is Long Island Railroad have to go through the same thing or with with this at this and where where do we test? Oh at Hillside. So we have a place at Hillside, inside. No outside at Hillside. <laughs> okay. Can I get a motion? Move. Second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Kerry. Michael. Yes, we have uh, uh, two competitive uh, procurement. Uh, uh, one for the one that's a little bit of a high rise for $525,000 for the Integral Corporation. Uh, and this is for a 30 month extension of time for the time of cars they all signed to do that. And, and just uh, cost uh, integration with our MPH uh, I get that. Uh, then we have a $200,000 uh, change uh, order to uh, the GPS to venture. Okay, I'm sorry. I hope you guys heard me. Go ahead. Um, what was that? You can read that, right, too. But in any event, uh, the uh, the GTF is really corrections to the uh, to the Q-tip in Long Island, and we are shifting three hundred thousand dollars from one contract to another. That's it. <coughs> Any questions? <coughs> Get a motion. So move. Second. Any all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. Carried. Okay, that concludes our meeting. Our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, November the fifteenth. 8.30 a.m. Need a motion to adjourn? Any opposed? Carry. Yeah. So now it's transit, right? Yeah.